We're going to get started, ladies. We have a double parsha. We have a lot happening this week. We have Bahar Bukhu Kaisai. So we have uh, a double parsha for anybody who's been following along in the parsha. Um, it is also Shabbos Mavarchim this week. That means this is the week that we bless the new month. We're going to bless the month of Sivan. Okay. We're going to bless the month of Sivan, which is the month of the giving of the Torah. So that is going to happen. So we're going to bless the month this week on Shabbos and Shul. And it is also Chazak. It is also the last. We are reading the, we are finishing the book of Vayikra. So we have like a super duper uh, head of, thank you, Shani. I was just going to ask you to close the door. So we have a lot of stuff going on in a short amount of time. So let's get started. So first of all, why is that relevant? Okay, so first, because we have Chazak, we also need to look at the whole Chumash Vayikra for a second as a whole. But we're going to first look at the two parshas that we're dealing with. Then we're going to look at the whole and we're going to try to make some nice challenges out of the whole thing. Um, additionally, just as some random uh, information, Sunday night and Monday are Yom Yerushalayim. It's Jerusalem Reunification Day. Say that quickly five times. Um, and so there was, there, this was the day in 1967 that we actually got the Kotel back and that Jerusalem was reunified after being uh, in Jordanian hands for 19 years. So it's a big day of celebration. There will be uh, marches and parades and stuff probably going along like from Gansakar to, to the Kotel through King George. It's like a, it's a big thing. So that's going on Sunday night and Monday. Okay. Bahar uh, Kosai. So we have two Torah portions. Parshas Bahar, what does Bahar mean? If you look in the first part, in the first Pasuk, chapter 25, verse one, that's where we're starting. Hashem el Moshe Bahar Sinai Lamor. Hashem says to Moshe, Behar Sinai. Yeah, Mount Sinai. At Mount Sinai, and he, this is what he's going to tell him. So the whole Parsha is called Parsha's Bahar, which means the mountain, uh, on the mountain. Okay. And the Parsha is not so long. It has, the beginning of the Parsha very, very much focuses on, um, on the laws of Shemitah. Okay on the laws of the sabbatical year. Next year, parenthetically, is going to be a sabbatical year again in Israel, where we, we celebrate the sabbatical years now just from rabbinic obligation, not from Torah obligation. So we have a whole conversation about the sabbatical year. We also have a conversation of the Jubilee year, which means just like we now are in the sphere period and we count seven times seven, we count 49 days in the times of the temple, we also counted seven times seven cycles of Shemitah. So we had seven times seven years, which would be 49 years. And the 50th year would be the Jubilee. It would be the Yovel. And in the Jubilee year, all slaves went back to their homes and all land went back to their original owners from when the Jews came into the land of Israel. So uh, except there were certain exceptions. If you sold uh, land or house in a walled city, there were, there were certain exceptions to the rule, but by and large, that was what happened. Jubilee, they, re they, they rang, oh my gosh. They blew a chauffeur on Yom Kippur and they proclaimed liberty throughout the land. If, you go to, if you're from Philadelphia, you go to Philadelphia and you see on the bell, it says, proclaim liberty, liberty throughout the land. This is where it's coming from. You should proclaim liberty throughout the land and everything kind of goes back, which basically means a couple of things. First of all, you never actually buy land in Israel. Okay, in biblical Israel, you didn't actually ever buy land. You never bought a field. You never bought a house. You essentially were leasing it until the Jubilee year. Okay, you, you, if you bought a field from somebody else, the Torah tells us that you have two years where the owner cannot redeem their field. They cannot buy it back. You get two years produce for sure. And after that, the owner can try to buy it back. And if the owner does not manage to buy it back, that in the Jubilee year, boom, it goes back to him anyway. That means if I'm buying a field from you and it's 25 years to the Jubilee, I'm only going to pay the worth of 25 crops because it's not a forever purchase. In Jubilee, it's going back to you. Um, and that's going to be the same for land and all different, if, all different, kind, of, uh, different kind of stuff going on over there. Um, Okay, so there's two things. First of all, the place that is not redeemable is if you, uh, if you sell somebody 
uh, land or a field in, in a walled city, it's usually not, it's usually a house, it's usually not land in a walled city, then you have one year to redeem it. If you, you do not redeem it, you, when we say you, we mean you or a family member or somebody who's close to you can help you with the redemption. If you do not do it in the first year, after the first year, it is no longer redeemable and it does not go back to you in a jubilee year. The exception to that rule is if it's a levy who sold their property, they always can redeem, they can always redeem their years. But for plain Jane Jew, um, if, you, if you sell a house in a walled city, so that's kind of very specific, then you have one year to redeem it, otherwise it, it's gone. Which also in a way is telling us, the Torah tells us there's no caste system. You're never forever a slave. You have like, you know, I'm sure in a, in a life with no penicillin and, you know, bad hygiene, 50 years is more than a lifetime, but, but there is no, there is no lifetime. You, you and your children, your children's children, you're all slaves. And because it doesn't happen in Judaism, a Jewish person for whatever uh, reasons they end up selling themselves as a slave will, uh, in Jubilee will always be going back to their home and they will be released. They also, by the way, parenthetically, Jewish slaves also get an exit during Shemitah in the sabbatical year. Ellen Ken, unless they say, I don't want to leave, I want to stay here, I like, I like this life, I like what's going on over here. So then the owner will bore a hole in their, they would make a hole in their ear. Um, and then they and then they become a slave forever. And the sages say it's not forever, it's only till the Jubilee year. So that's really when we talk about forever, that's where it ends, it ends at Jubilee. Okay. Um, now, there you go, I'm just trying to think. Um, okay, now if you take a look for a second, chapter 25, verse 14, it's the second aliyah of Bahar when they're not combined, okay? So it's the middle of the first aliyah when they are combined. It says, if the ki timkru mimkar lamitech, if you sell something to your fellow or you buy from the hand of your fellow, you're not allowed to be dishonest, disingenuous uh, with, with, your, with your people. This one line here is probably the source of many, many, many books in your Jewish halacha library, because pretty much all the laws of how do we acquire items, how does somebody actually buy something, um, are derived from this. Are derived from this verse. Um, we're talking here about things that are movable objects, not land, not uh, you know, not houses. But if I buy whatever. Anything that I can move, whether it's a cow, whether it's a bag of potato chips, whether it's a car, uh, those are all movable objects. And then Torah has ways, how do I actually acquire ownership? Um, and we're not going to get into the laws, but I'm just pointing out there that smack here in the middle of the, the laws of Shemitah and Yovo, um, we have this kind of, this law, which is, it's, it's kind of, I don't want to say it's weird, that it's the placement of it here, but it is interesting because Shemitah and Yovo, sabbatical and jubilee years are only applicable in the land of Israel. And from a biblical perspective, they're only applicable when the majority of the Jewish people live in the land of Israel, okay? Which means that from a biblical point of view, we have not been following these laws since the end of the first temple period when the 10 tribes were taken off by the Assyrian king and we've never seen them again. So the conversation of how, you know, it's a very, very specific place and time that this is going to be applicable to. And yet these laws of, of purchases are kind of smack here in the middle of, of holy spaces and holy times and the land being holy and da-da-da. And it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Um, perhaps, perhaps to tell us that, that everything that we do has to be holy. Even our regular buying and selling and our interactions all have to be a step above. We don't have the, 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 the ordinary of a Jew is meant to be holy. And, and perhaps that's why this is here. Now there's laws and books and books and books about how exactly it works, but that I think is just one little takeaway kind of hidden over here in the middle of all these, um, in, in the middle of all these, uh, in the middle of all these laws over here. Okay. And that gonna, most of Bahar, most of the first Parsha is going to talk about Again, the details of uh, the, the details of Shemitah and Yovel, and then it's going to go into redeeming your land. 
Torah definitely tells us that if you see in Ravi chapter 25, verse 25, that if your brother is poor and sells from his, his uh, ancestral lands, um, then somebody who's close to him can come and try to redeem it back. Um, you know, we always talk about how location, 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 you know, real estate is like a, a thing. It starts from Torah, the, the place of your ancestral lands, the land that was given to you by Hashem when you came into the land of Israel. Don't sell it easily. Don't, it, it's not, it's not like, oh, it's okay. I just want to move to Vancouver. So I'm going to like, no, we don't do that. We don't do that. We, uh, we really are very careful about only selling the land of Israel um, for, for really um, dire purposes. And, and at the same time, Torah teaches different kinds of laws that you don't sell all of your property. Don't become, don't sell all of your fields so that you don't, the Torah tells us, keep a little bit of a field for yourself so you have a place to grow vegetables and stuff for you to eat so that you don't become a charity case, you know, even though your situation is really bad. Like it's, it's considered, it's not considered a great thing. And then if, hmm? Okay, so right now, all of these laws are non-existent. We don't have the lineup of who owns what and what's going on. Um, it's interesting that in Israel, um, even on a practical level, officially you don't actually ever buy the land that your house sits on. The state owns it. You own the house, you can own building rights, but you don't actually own the land. Oh yeah, and they want to turn that house down and mix under their house. Oh, for sure, for sure. Like own it, it's like not there. It's 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 very complicated here. The the state actually own the state actually. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I I you know I would just some well-meaning early decision making i don't know i don't know the truth of that is very interesting that that uh, the vatican actually owns a lot of land in israel and it's only leased to to different um com uh, the companies but like they had a building on the corner of aza and karen high so it was a library that hebrew university had leased for 99 years and guess what when the lease was up they took it back it's like they own a lot of land and so yeah but, but really, actually, you don't act, even in Israel today, you don't buy the land that your house sits on. It actually all is owned by the state. It, I mean, it doesn't have practical ramifications. It doesn't really have practical ramifications. They can't come and kick your house off the land and keep the land. But, you know, there's a certain place where, yeah, for ownership purposes. Okay. Um, and, okay, then we talked about the house that you sell. And, and really, there's a place where, the, where Rashi says that there's this kind of, um, um, a downward progression that if we don't keep Shemitah and Yovel, and th then what's going to happen is that we're going to be in a position that we are going to uh, sell our parts of our field or parts of, or sell our house or sell ourselves. And that's really where the Torah is going to go into the different things. What happens if you don't have enough, if you're, if you're very poor and you have to sell part of your field, or you have to sell your house and how do you sell your, you have to sell yourself and you have to sell yourself to a Jew, you have to sell yourself to a non-Jew. All these kind of downward um, slope where, where Rashi says it starts off by not keeping Shemitah, by not keeping the laws of, of, of Shemitah and Yovel, and then it sort of ends up having a, um, huh? Yeah, like it's like a snowball effect kind of situation going on over there, okay? Um, and then it touches a little bit on how, if you do own a Jewish slave, uh, what are you allowed to do or not allowed to do with a Jewish slave? I know slavery is like, uh, a trigger word and everybody's like <gasps> but the the talmud actually says like about jewish slave misha kana evid kana rabba that's my that if you buy yourself a slave you actually buy a master for yourself the talmud is very very careful about the master is not allowed to eat fine bread and give his slave poor bread he's not allowed to just tell him to he's not allowed to give him degrading work to do he's not allowed to give him work that's purposeless he can't tell the he can't tell the slave make me a cup of tea when he doesn't really want to drink a cup of tea. You're, you're, it's very, the Torah is very careful about how uh, one uh, may or may not treat a Jewish slave. You also have to, are in charge of taking care of their family, their wife and children if they're married and making sure that they also have, they're also sustained. And at the same time, you're not allowed to use the wife and children as extra labor in the field. It's, it's, uh, it's complicated. And, and you really, if you actually look into the laws, nobody's buying a Jewish slave for, for value. It's like, 
totally a, a chesed thing. It's totally a helping another person thing, helping them get out of a bad financial situation or, or otherwise. So yeah, that's what's going on over here. Um, and then we talk the fields. Okay, the end of the parsha of Bahar, which then we're going to cross over, talks about not making uh, gods, uh, statues, and, and uh, uh, yeah, idols, and not to make a matzeba, which is a, like um, a, an altar to, to bring sacrifices not in the temple. So that we have that we have that we have that, uh, that those provisions here, and also to keep Shabbos. That's the end of it. And now we're moving over into Parshas Bechukotai. Um, and um, it talks of Bechukotai, and it says that in Bechukotai Telechu, if you go in my statutes and you watch my mitzvahs and you do them, and it goes into all different kinds of really beautiful, lovely things that Hashem is going to give us if we, in fact, do them. Now, uh, we know that in Judaism, we have laws divided to many different, we can divide them in different ways. One of the ways that we divide mitzvot are if I'm giving you a hint and saying uh, kotai, we have in here the chok. Okay. How would we? Oh, you did here. Good. A chokim and mishpatim you have up here? Yes. Okay. Oh, we didn't know we were cheap. Huh? We erased it. Okay, fine. So here we're talking about kotai. We're talking about if you go in the specifics. So what are kotai, Emma? We don't understand. Like other than for exactly. So the, it's so it's for it's mitzvahs for serving Hashem. Um, so then Hashem, we go into a bunch of uh, very lovely things that will happen. You'll have uh, you'll have your rain and your your you know you'll have your produce and everything wonderful and lovely and whatever. And you'll have peace. Um, and you'll win over your enemies. Blah blah blah. Okay, and then. And then what happens? And then what happens is, and in chapter 26, verse 14, then what happens? And, and what if you don't? And what if you don't listen? And not only if you don't listen, it's very interesting that in verse 15, what does it tell you? In the Chukotai, if you despise my mitzvahs, Okay, it doesn't mean you're not doing them. It just means really you, you really like, here we go again with those, right? You know, it doesn't mean you're not doing it. It does not mean you're not in this. In, so and now we're going to go into a slew of maledictions, which is a nice word, um, right? Maledictions. What's the opposite of a, of a blessing is a malediction. You don't want to use the, you know, that kind of like, words so we use like those words so maledictions we actually have a list of 45 over here if we do not uh serve Hashem and it's interesting um Torah actually gives us two sets of of these maledictions in Hebrew it's called the tochacha it's called the rebuke um we have it here and we also have it in Parsha Kitavo when we come into the land which is going to be in the end of the book of Deuteronomy um, both of these slews of, and if you don't, meaning both, if you do, and if you don't, what will happen? Um, it, it always comes out. This one always comes out before Shavuot, but never the week before Shavuot. And Kitavo is always before Rosh Hashanah, but never the week right before Rosh Hashanah. The, the, the way the sages look at it is like, he, a little bit, first of all, you know, it's like Shavuos and Rosh Hashanah are both starts. They're both kind of starts on the calendar. This is our start for Torah. This is our relationship with Torah starts in Shavuot. Rosh Hashanah is obviously creation and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so there's two things. First of all, there's like an out with the old and in with the new. So like if anything was supposed to happen, like yala, it's done, like take it away. But also you can't go into the Chag with this as your reading. This can't be your last reading before you go into Shavuot or into Rosh Hashanah. If you read it, and we're not going to read it together, it is heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. And if you're a student of Jewish history, we've done most of these things. These things have happened to us multiple times. Um, and, and it is heartbreaking. It is mamish. There's no other word for it. Um, uh, the 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 
the explicitness of what's going to happen if we don't follow Hashem. Um, and so how can we hear this and then just tralala in Pachag, right? We know next week we're going to read the, we're going to read Parshish uh, uh, Bamidbar. And um, I mean, could you imagine if this was our, Shavuos is Sunday night, not this coming Sunday night, but the next night. Can you imagine like this was our reading on Shabbat and Sunday night is like hug. So the sages understood that there has to be this buffer period before we go into, before we go into it. So we do have, this is going on. I mean, we spoke about a different time about how the Torah portions aren't totally linked to the year, but a little bit they are. And this is one of the places where they are kind of linked a little bit to the year. Um, and, and I want to talk about this a little bit. Okay, I want to talk about this because, like, how could you not? It's like the, it's it's a big thing. This this parsha has forty five uh, maledictions. In Kitavo, it has ninety eight. Um, uh, in Kitavo, it talks about uh, that this this will happen because you tachat asher lo vaditem et Hashem alokecha besimcha obutuv levav because you did not serve God with joy. That's that time here we're having this 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 discussion. It's it's not even wrote. It's like oh, I can't believe I've seen this is again. You know, like and and that place of forget about we aren't pulling out the joy, but the place of it coming from a place of of just not like not wanting to do it, not wanting to be there is already a statement on, um, of our relationship with Hashem. You know, if, if somebody, you know, I always say this, somebody that you love can do no wrong and somebody who you don't like can do no right. You know, if we had a relationship with Hashem and he asked us to do something that was uncomfortable or weird or we didn't understand, but, but it's Hashem, we have a relationship, like, of course we're happy to do it. But the place of like, Here's your stinking mitzvah. You know, like that's already, that's showing on our relationship. And that's part of what Hashem is really, um, it, it's hurtful. It's very hurtful. I know it's a funny thing to say hurtful for Hashem, but it's a very, it's a very, it's not, it's not a good place to be. Um, the other thing, which is very, which I also want to talk about a little bit. If you look through the, the blessings that Hashem gives us, which we could spend some, wait, I'm going to finish one more thing about this part. Um, sages also tell us, that the two types of, um, the two sets of, of tochacha, of rebuke, actually also refer to different times of the Jewish, of our Jewish exile. So this one, which is shorter, refers to the destruction of, after the destruction of the first temple and that period of the 70 years when the Jews went to Babylonia and they were exiled for that short amount of time. And it has words of hope. It has that you will remember Hashem when you're in the land of your enemies and you will turn to Hashem and you will do tshuva and Hashem will remember you and he will bring you back. The other one that's got more than twice as long is referring to the exile that happens after the destruction of the second temple and it has no nice words. It has no promise of return. And you know we can actually see that in the actual exiles today, we are thousands of years into the, into the exile and please God, we hope that it's gonna end, you know, Yay, even today, like I'm bring it on, you know, like I'm ready. But but the place of of feeling the nice, comforting words is not so much uh is not so much uh found in these in these in these in these parshias. Um I'm actually gonna I want to just finish the parsha before we uh before we go into to some things. Um chapter 27, which is uh towards the end of this of this of, of the Hukotai talks about um, if somebody wants to uh, give the value of a person to the temple. Okay, it's called Erkin. It's, it's the value. It has nothing to do with how talented, how beautiful, how smart, how anything. It's 100% age and gender. And the Torah assigns specific values for age and gender. Some of the sages talk about that's what they would be worth if they were sold as a slave. But if somebody says, I would like to donate the value of Rikashira, to the temple, then this is, you would just look up at the chart and, you know, you would know how much you would have to give. So that's kind of, and it goes, you can do it for fields, you can do it for houses, but for people, it's actually, it's not evaluated. It's has nothing to do with this is a, the greatest sage or, 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 you know, whatever. It's really just, uh, it has nothing to do with their accomplishments and how many books they've written or anything. Um, 
So that's one thing that, that I can give the value of somebody. I can also give the value of my house. I don't want to give my house to the temple, but I want to give the value of my house to the temple or the tabernacle. And then it would be evaluated. And there's a whole conversation. There's long Gemara's about this, um, of what we do. Um, then it gives, it tells us that uh, in verse 26, that um, the firstborn animals are a separate gift that's given to Hashem. Um, and if it's a non-kosher firstborn animal, then you, you, um, you redeem it and give the money. And then it talks about towards the end, it talks about, then it talks about um, uh, things that are donated to the temple. You're not allowed to then take back. It's a whole different conversation. And then the end, 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 like literally the last couple of verses, it talks about that if you give, if you, from your animals, you need to give a tenth of your animals um, as a gift to Hashem. There's a Meister Behema that you have to give. And, and the Torah tells us how you do it, okay? How do you do it? You have to pass them under a stick. You put all the newborn animals into one pen, and then you let them out slowly, and you start counting one, two, three four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And animal number 10, you give a, like a, a like a, you put some dye on them. Like a, I don't know whatever, I don't know if it makes a difference what color dye. You have a, like a pot with dye and you dye uh, like to color dye, not to, to kill dye. Cause that would make sense in English anyway. So you dye animal number 10 and you keep letting all the animals out and you, and then you, all the ones of the dye become the animals that have to be taken to Jerusalem and given to, given the, uh, they get um, given to Hashem over there. And it's a very interesting thing. Are they, huh? are they given to the uh, They are, no, they're taken to, to Hashem. They're given to, you bring, I think you bring it to, to the base of Mikdash. The, I'm sure the Kohanim get part of it, but you don't kill them. What do no, you, you no no you're taken they're taken there they must I think I don't know for sure but I don't remember I think that they're divided amongst the Kohanim or maybe parts get offered as a sacrifice but you don't bring the live animals there and it here talks about you don't it's brought as an offering it says on thirty two the monster animal is brought as an offering after offering the humble and all the deities by the owner of the death none of it is oh okay there's your answer thank you Emma for checking the sources. Okay, so I want to say a couple of things. First of all, first of all, Jerusalem was always a hotspot for people who, uh, who they always knew that there was, there, was, there was food available because if somebody has to bring their animals and they have to eat it in Jerusalem, they have money, certain, certain items you can exchange, the, you don't have to schlep the item, you could exchange it for money and use the money in Jerusalem and eat it there. You don't care if the guy in Jerusalem is overcharging you because you have to use all this money here. It's all hectic money. It's all holy money that has to be used here. So use it. People will come and they're going to get food. There's going to be party. You couldn't possibly eat all that meat by yourself. You don't have a long time to eat it. Most sacrifices you have a day, two days. It's like you don't have a long time for this. There's always, um, and if you walk around the streets of Jerusalem today, you see that as well. There's always uh, people who, you know, collecting stuck over here, the Jerusalem was always part of this. I wanna say a couple of things about this. First of all, the Talmud tells us about somebody, I'm, I'm blanking on his name, one of the Tanaim who was very rich and his miser, the amount of animals that he needed to bring, if I'm not mistaken, was like 120,000 animals. That was a 10th of his, of his flock. Okay, let's say somebody doesn't have to bring that many. Let's say I had, I have to bring 50 animals, right? Torah isn't telling you, count them up, pull out 50, take the best, take the worst. That's not what's going on. There's very much a place of random going on here. You have to herd all the animals into, the sh into a pen. You have to let them out one by one. You have to mark the 10th animal. Like the number is gonna be the same. I'm going to break it to you. Like if you, if you say, I had this many animals born this year, this is a tenth of them, the number is going to be the same. And yet there is this place that Hashem is saying, I want you to go through the effort of, of counting and being there. And they tell a story of a, of a Hasidic rabbi who went to, who was collecting money. And um, 
and he went to somebody who was very rich and he asked him for a very, very large amount of money. And the guy was like, well, it's so much money, and, you know, I'm paraphrasing, you probably didn't say it exactly like that, but, and, and, and so he said to him, okay, let's, you know, they have this thing of, of the 10th animal, that means you get to keep nine, that means I get one is for me, two is for me, three is for me, four is for me, five, six, seven, eight, nine is for me, okay, one for God. So it, it reminds you of how much bounty you actually have before you say, get upset that you have to give to God. So he's like, so do we want to now sit and do, evaluate all your businesses and all your everything and then say, how much do you really have to give to God? What is your 10% of your actual worth? And the guy's like, okay, I'll give you the money, right? So on the one hand, there, this, this process of counting out and then giving a 10th to God on the one hand, it reminds us of the incredible, incredible blessings that we have gotten from Hashem. Because if somebody just said, take all these animals and give them to Hashem, it's like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. This is so much. How could I? What am I? Wait, you're focusing also on the, I get to keep this. I get to keep this. I get to keep this. Okay, and this one goes to Hashem. So there's one place of the place of gratitude. The other thing that we talk about, and this is really uh, a little bit more on a, on a, I guess on a spiritual or, you know, kind of, kind of place is we all, you know, when you say the number 10 and you learned a little bit of Hasidus, what are we talking about? What's 10? <laughs> 10, 10 spheres, right? We have 10 spheres, we have 10 powers, 10 spiritual powers of the soul. And when we, when we look at ourselves and we look at the, our, our animal and we say this, and this and this, but this goes, you know, and, and here to give this to Hashem, to be able to remind ourselves, it's, it's sometimes the place of random, you know, you could say, you're not saying to the person, give me the, 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 your best animals. You're saying whatever comes out is what Hashem wants. You have a hundred animals born, you're going to have to give 10. You're not picking and saying whether you want to give the best or you want to give the worst, it doesn't matter. It's going to really, however, they're going to come through that through that, uh, that doorway, that's how it's gonna happen. And when we look at ourselves and we think, oh, this is probably what I would love to give this Hashem, and Hashem's like, but that's what I want. What's your 10th? What's your 10th? And then Hashem says, that, that you have, that you don't, you don't value. Hashem's like, but that's my 10th, and I want that. There's something in you, in each and every one of us, that's going to come to the forefront if we allow it to and that's why Hashem is saying like that's where that's that's what your contribution is it's not the one that's the most beautiful and it's not it could be it could be sometimes the animal that comes through is going to be the most beautiful most amazing whatever and sometimes it's not going to be sometimes it can be an animal that can't be offered as a sacrifice it's going to have some kind of blemish and it's not going to be able to offer it as a sacrifice it still is part of the of the Hashem's Hashem basket over there so before we we uh before we, um, you know, discount within ourselves the things that, oh, that couldn't possibly be God worthy. Yeah, let's think about it again before we, before you do this. So that's one thing. And that is really where the Chomish is going to end. Okay, it's going to talk about again, Har Sinai. Um, so now let's make a little bit of sense out of this challenge. Okay, we have a lot of stuff going on over here. Bahar opens up with Har Sinai. It starts with excuse me, it, talks about, it starts with Mount Sinai, it talks about Shemitah. Shemitah is going to be referenced again in the Tochacha that we have, that the land is going to then get its, its quiet years if you don't. You need that here, we're definitely having this place of the Tochacha, the, rebu the rebuke, the maledictions are definitely coming from a place of Shemitah related. We have again the Sinai, uh, it, the, 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 the maledictions and um, at the uh, chapter 26 of verse 46. These are the laws and the Mishpatim and the Torah that Hashem gave to, between him and the Israel, Bahar Sinai, Bad Moshe. That again, we're having that Sinai um, tag, you know, what's it called? Um, like a hyperlink, you know, in a, in a text. Like we're having Sinai being a hyperlink a few times in these, these two parshias. So there's something going on about Sinai that it's all, that it's, it's coming back to Sinai as well. Um, and uh, so I want to talk about, oh, we're doing fine for them. So what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about Sinai for a second. Okay, we talk about Har, we talk about the mountain, we talk about um, 
this place of pride, but we know from, from the Medrash, we know that Sinai was also not the biggest mountain. It wasn't the tallest, it wasn't the widest, it wasn't the most beautiful. Um, that the place of pride in a Jew's life is uh, a fine balancing act, right? We're, we're not personally prideful, but the place of being prideful because I'm a Jew and I'm not, you know, I'm not a shmata. And I, I, as a Jew, we deserve, you know, me individually, maybe not, but as a Jew, as a representative of God in this world, to be able to walk with our heads high and bright and, you know, that place of, of the mountain. Um, I want to tag that for a second. And that everything that we do really is coming back to that place of, of Sinai, that it all comes from Hashem. What, no matter what it is that we're doing, Rashi says over here in the beginning of Parshish Bahar, he says, um, he says, uh, he says, Ma'in and Shmita Etel Har Sinai. Why are we talking about Shmita by, by Sinai? All, didn't all the missiles come from Sinai? But just like here, we're having all these details and it's being hyperlinked to Sinai. That means everything that we got is really hyperlinked to Sinai. And all the missiles we do is really all, we're doing it because Hashem said, we're not doing the missiles because we like them specifically. We're doing them because Hashem told us to do the missiles. And this is how we're doing our, this, our relationship with Hashem. Okay. Now, once we get into the maledictions, Hashem uses a word here. Um, just going to look for it a second. Okay, it's in chapter 40, chapter, chapter 26, verse 21. And it's you're actually going to repeat this word a few times through the, through the conversation of the maledictions. In telcho imi keri, if you walk with me, keri. Um, and then you don't, and you, and you, you despise to listen to me and everything's going to go downhill from there, right? So the question that the sages ask is, what does carry mean? Okay. <laughs> so what does carry mean? Carry means happenstance. It just happened. Like mikra, it happened. Okay, mikra. It just happened. Things just happen. I don't have to learn from them. They just happened on their own. I had no involvement in this. I had no say in this. It was not me at all. It just happened, right? Who broke this? Who did this? Who? It just happened. I, it just happened, right? What's our whole book called? What's our book called? Vayikra. Vayikra has the word carry in there, ish. If you, if, you, if you play with the words a little bit, oh, it's totally different. It's a totally different, it's a totally different conversation. Vayikra is purposeful calling out to us. And he called, Hashem calls out to each and every one of us. We start with Hashem come, calling to us individually, personally, individually, you know, very, we, we spoke about this a different time. Vayikra is like calling you specifically. I have something to tell you. And Kerry is like this, whatever. Like it's just, you know, what is our relationship with Hashem? Is our relationship with Hashem Vayikra that Hashem is calling out to us? We are calling out to him. We want to have a relationship or is our relationship whatever, that's Kerry. And Hashem's like, you could be living a life of Torah and mitzvahs and still be Kerry. It could still be like, I'm not so into it. like I do it, like whatever, you know, but it isn't purposeful and it isn't meaningful and it isn't done because Hashem and I have a relationship. We have a relationship, we're gonna do a mitzvah. We're like so happy to bring this mitzvah to Hashem because you know, my kids sometimes I probably shouldn't say this like on a recorded thing, but like they sometimes bring flowers when they come back from they not even, you know, whatever. And like they're not the most gorgeous, you know, hot, hot, hot house roses. They're like, you know, slightly crushed side to be, but, but they picked it for me. They did it for me. And it's, that makes them special and that makes them beautiful. Our mitzvahs might not be like, we should work to make our mitzvahs beautiful and shining as well. But the place of, the place of, of reminding ourselves that our lives are not happenstance. Our relationship with Hashem is not happenstance. It is purposeful. 
It is meaningful. And we're, we're starting the beginning of Vayikra. We talk about sacrifices. The end of Vayikra, we talk about us bringing sacrifices again, the place of, of, uh, of the, this, this giving this gift to Hashem or even the sacrifices that we bring of our tenth of our animal. We're, we're, it's wrapping up into a package that says our relationship with Hashem should be purposeful, should be meaningful, should be intentional you know, very like that's one of the buzzwords today, like of conscious living and conscious eating and like those kind of words. Tara has been saying these words for, for thousands of years. Live purposefully, live meaningfully, live on a conscious level. Be, don't be reactionary, be actionary. I don't know if that's a real word. Um, so I want to give us all a bracha that this week we have, um, this week we, like I said, we're blessing the new moon. We're blessing the new month. We're blessing the month of Sivan. It's the month that we get Torah in. Um, and we're coming from, so we're going into the month of Torah. We're coming from the month of Iyar. And we've spoken about it here. And it's been bandied about that Iyar is Ani Hashem Rofecha. I am Hashem who heals you. We're coming from a month of spiritual healing as we work every single day, counting the Omer and working on that. Hopefully not just counting, but doing the work that the counting is supposed to be doing to brighten and beautify all those days and now we're going into the month of Torah so this Shabbos really has the overlap of both of those things happening we have the spiritual healing and the the, the Torah kind of overlapping so I want to give us a bracha that we see in Torah the beauty and the and the shining that the that we've been working on through the sphere that we should be able to in our own lives be able to see how it is purposeful and meaningful and beautiful and shining and that it should we should be blessed with a month of Torah of healing of Hashem shining his light on the Jewish people individually collectively that we all should be able to see and feel just the most amazing light that's that's coming from Hashem and we should be able to respond to that not be afraid to be warmed by the light of Hashem and to be able to yeah be able to give back to Hashem purposefully and meaningfully um, in, in our relationship with Him and our daily in our daily life. Have an awesome rest of the day. That is my two cents on the subject.